So I want to talk today about, uh, particularly about constituency campaigns in Canadian elections, and particularly in the 2015 election. Uh, Canadian Party's national campaigns are accompanied by these, these riding campaigns that have to be run in each of the nation's constituencies. And a lot of the, the, the focus that we see in election campaigns on the national campaign and the leaders tour and the leaders and the leaders debate distracts us from the fact that the structure of the electoral system dictates that if parties want to win, they have to win more votes than other candidates in a majority of individual seats in this country. And so there's this very important local element to Canadian elections that we don't always pay a lot of attention to during national campaigns. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that and about the organizations that parties and, and, uh, and candidates muster uh, in the constituencies to get the jobs done, to get the job done. So the goals of constituency campaigns in the 2015 campaign remained largely identical to those of campaigns in the past. Uh, 2015, however, did see some innovation in how constituency campaigns pursue their goals. So I'm going to be discussing this, making some observations uh, from the campaign when I traveled with seven candidates uh, for a few days each during the election campaign, went door knocking with them and went to uh, went to uh, events and that sort of thing while they were campaigning in a, in a number of ridings. So I'll be providing some anecdotal examples. This is data. It's just not being presented in a, uh, in a, in a systematic way. So first, let's identify constituency campaigns' goals. Uh, there are two of them. First of all, constituency campaigns exist to identify supporters that exist in the riding. That's by far the most important function, identify supporters and make sure that they get out to vote on election day. And second is identify and persuade undecided voters. The most important function, identify supporters, get them out. The second is find out who hasn't made up their mind and try to convince them to some extent. So anything that local campaigns do should be interpreted as, uh, or should be viewed as, as meeting one of those two goals. Constituency campaigns draw on an arsenal of methods to achieve these goals. Uh, canvassing and phone calls are used to identify supporters. Literature drops, door hangers, signs are used to help persuade undecided voters, as well as kind of give the campaign a sense of momentum as well. In urban and suburban ridings, campaigns also achieve these goals by positioning candidates and volunteers along busy roadways and transit stops. I don't see that as much in Winnipeg because it turns out it gets really cold here. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, but in Vancouver, in busy transit stops, you see candidates out uh, with their supporters and signs trying to give the campaign a sense of, uh, of momentum. On election day, campaigns dispatch scrutineers uh, who mark off supporters who cast their ballots at the polls. There are runners who retrieve these sheets from scrutineers uh, and take them back to the campaign office, callers who call supporters who haven't yet cast their ballots, and then drivers who fan out into the riding to, to shuttle and ferry these uh, supporters to, to the polls. So when all of these components come together, especially on election day, what you get is a well-oiled machine, uh, a, a constituency campaign that can maximize the effect of these, of these campaigns. But when they don't have the resources in terms of personnel or staff, some of these components will be missing. These campaigns can't maximize the effect of a, of a, of a good local campaign. The most important thing that local campaigns do is the local canvas, uh, which remains the centerpiece of any strong constituency campaign. This is door knocking, and it is by far the most important thing that local campaigns do. Face-to-face -face contact, both campaign managers and political scientists know increasingly know is the gold standard for convincing supporters to get out to vote. And canvassing also allows for a reliable record of supporters to be constructed during the campaign itself. So campaigns typically commit substantial resources, by resources I mean both volunteers and money, into, uh, into the local canvas. And you actually can use money to canvas, as we'll, uh, as we'll see. You don't need people, you can use money. So, we can make three observations about campaigning in uh, 2015 uh, from this discussion about the, uh, the local canvas. First is that there's enormous variability in the resources that are available to local campaigns in order to uh, uh, engage in this behavior. Some MPs hit the streets with a group of six or more volunteers at once. Uh, one volunteer typically has the phone or the iPad and walks down the middle of the street. Uh, records people's names, whether residents or supporters, 
while the other volunteers knock on doors. And if, if a resident is home, they call out to the candidate, the candidate jogs up to the door and kind of gives the party pitch. Uh, it's a very effective way to cover an enormous amount of, of space in a short amount of time, allowing the candidate to skip uh, houses which aren't, supporters don't live there where no one is home. Uh, and I got to see this in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Winnipeg. Uh, but of course that requires a lot of people to actually work with you at the same time in the middle of the day in an election campaign. On the other hand, uh, uh, some other candidates canvass by themselves. Uh, they go from door to door and wait to see if anyone answers the door. If no one is there, they waste a huge amount of time and the amount of space that candidates can cover in these campaigns is, uh, is very limited. So we see a lot of variability in terms of the personnel that's available to these, uh, these campaigns. Second, we did see some technological innovation in 2015. Uh, the most important example of this were the apps on, on mobile phones that pretty much all canvassers had. With a few exceptions in the NDP, we had some local campaigns using paper still to write information down. Uh, certainly all conservative candidates would have had uh, an app provided to them where information on households was uploaded from Elections Canada uh, and previous information about whether or not the person was a supporter, voter, uh, member donated to the party. All this information was available to uh, the candidate and uh, his or her team as they went from door to door. And so this was a very effective, efficient way to identify supporters as well as to remind them to get them out to the polls, also see if they needed a ride and to uh, collect this information. They also, the apps also had GPS so you could track the location of canvassers. So you had this nice coordination, teams could coordinate and uh, move around between different neighborhoods. I actually got to use this, uh, a candidate, um, we went to a, a, a senior's residence and she was getting tired, so she said, listen, can you just do the top floor for me? And I said, sure, I'll do that, it was a lot of fun. I got to, uh, to uh, canvas and use this new technology. And finally, uh, third observation, uh, we saw how, or the canvas illustrates some ways in which the, the central campaign was trying to direct local campaigns in, uh, in 2015. The best example of this was the conservative campaign, which actually mandated the, the number of supporters that local campaigns had to identify on a daily basis. Local campaigns had to go to house to house and identify a certain quota of supporters each day, and this was monitored by the national campaign, oftentimes via that, that app. The, the national party had access to the information in the, in the apps that volunteers had on their phones. Um, and if you fell below that, uh, you could expect the national office to give the campaign office a call and say, get to work. Uh, and so we did see some kind of loose control over these local campaigns. Another example is uh, uh, this got a lot of coverage in the campaign, conservative candidates not going to all candidates forums. Uh, people interpreted this as arrogant conservative candidates. In fact, it was coming from the central party office. The central party office was providing very strong advice to candidates, especially uh, first-time candidates, that going to all candidates' forums was a bad use of time. It was much better for them to be out identifying supporters, doing door knocking and canvassing. If you, their idea was that if you go to an all candidates' forum, everyone in the audience has already made up their mind. It's a waste of time. It's better to be out uh, uh, canvassing. So we do see some examples of, of central, central control not even control, persuasion, trying to control certain aspects of local campaigns. Um, a classic question about uh, parties in general, especially campaigning, is whether or not campaigns are labor or they're capital intensive. I hinted at this a, a little bit earlier. And everything that I've said would seem to suggest that constituency campaigns would be very labor intensive. They require lots of people. They require grassroots armies. And of course, that's, that's true. It's a great way to run a local campaign is to have an army of volunteers that can help you canvas and uh, do all these things. But we also saw in 2015 that money can increasingly be used to replace volunteers. And there's a few examples of this. Uh, there are companies, uh, there are community leaders that can send basically kids out uh, into the community to do a canvas. Uh, some campaigns actually did this at the outset of the campaign. They paid a company to do a quick canvas of the riding, and then they did so themselves again during the election campaign just to confirm that information. Uh, some campaigns hired uh, companies to put up election signs along roads and on lawns and also to maintain those signs throughout the campaign. Uh, signs uh, get vandalized during campaigns. We hear about this sometimes. And, these companies got paid to basically make sure they stayed up. 
Uh, and of course, there's also the idea of robocalls. Uh, some campaigns will have volunteers doing calls. Other campaigns have money. They can hire firms to do this for them. One campaign in Winnipeg uh, paid to shoot four robocalls on election day to every single supporter. I'm, I'm sure some of you were thrilled to get four phone calls on election day for one campaign telling you to get out to the polls. So the, what can we take from this? Volunteers are undoubtedly important. They uh, uh, can be used, they're useful, but increasingly we see that local campaigns, just like parties in general, finding ways for parties to replace volunteers with money, uh, and you can do so effectively to a certain extent. So I'll wrap up by saying constituency campaigning, uh, it's by its nature a massive exercise in, in voter engagement and mobilization. Uh, while the national campaigns, they sometimes engage in, in voter suppression, they try to drive down turnout through things like negative advertising. This comes from the national campaign. Constituency campaigns exist to literally move voters from their homes to voting booths. They exist to mobilize voters, and I think these are, as a result, of important democratic actors uh, on, the, on that basis. Good, thank you. Given the technologies that are available to parties in campaigning now, and the next logical step, it seems to me, is that party leaders will sit in Ottawa for the duration of the campaign and give interviews and give televised speeches. Uh, and there's, there really won't be much need for them to travel around. This idea that leaders have to travel around seems to be a throwback to kind of an old-fashioned era in Canadian politics. Uh, and it, it's sort of recognition of the nature of, of uh, the electoral system. You do have to win in individual ridings. But no matter how many people the party leader shakes hands with during an election campaign or who sees them at a rally, it's not going to be that many. So what's the point? Most people see the leader on TV anyway. So uh, this just kind of seems like the logical extension of, uh, of, of modern campaign technology to me. Leave voter contact with the people that are adapted to do it, the decentralized campaign organizations in, in each of the ridings. And in fact, I can draw on this research. We, we, we know from other research that parties do get a little bump. They get a little bump in local support if the leader visits the riding. Uh, but what I also found is that uh, campaign organizations are not thrilled when the leader lands in town. It's an enormous logistical difficulty and it's also an enormous distraction for local campaigns who for the entirety of the campaign are running their own show, are doing things on their own for the most part and then all of a sudden they have to have this big event and, uh, and, and get people out and there's uh, people from Ottawa giving them orders. So from a local perspective, the leader visiting is not, uh, is not necessarily a good thing and increasingly I don't think it's going to do much for parties anymore either. <laughs>